Welcome back, dear students. Let's turn our attention to transactions and the different types of transactions, and then where can we actually look up uh, de detailed information about our potential stocks. But first, let's take a quick look at the bull market versus bear market definitions. And the, these terms come from uh, antiquity a long time ago and we're not exactly sure where they exactly came from but bull markets are associated with rising prices favorable markets normally associated with rising prices investor optimism economic recovery recovery and government stimulus whereas a bear market is an unfavorable market normally associated with falling prices a pessimism, economic slowdown, and government restraint. So remember that, bulls and bears. Now, I like to think, and I think this is where the bull came from, bulls charge ahead, right? That When they attack, they, they, they throw their opponents up in the air. Whereas bears are more reclusive, uh, they try to stay away from people, but when they do attack, they knock their opponents down with their paws. Now, I don't know if that helps or not. But I don't think that's the real reason it's called a bear market. It has something to do with uh, the uh, folks in the 1800s, and I think probably earlier too, 1700s, who went hunting for bears. And uh, the saying comes from, don't sell the bear skin before the bear is caught. Now, I don't know how you get from that to a bear market in stocks, but supposedly that's where it comes from. And if you are so inclined... Go do some research and then you can explain it to me, okay? <laughs> okay, great. So now let's now take a look at the types of stock transactions. There are four major types, but the one that I always use is the market order, personally. Uh, these others are a little tricky, a little subtle in how they work, but they allow you to, to sort of get the price that you are interested in. But when you do one of the other three, the limit order, the stop loss, or the stop limit, you're not guaranteed that you're ever going to buy or sell the stock that you're interested in. You see, at a, at a market order, whatever the market price is, you're going to get it. You're either going to sell or you're going to buy, Okay, whatever the market price is. And remember, when we look at the inter, on, through the Internet at, and one of the Internet sites that shows the quotes, we're seeing the quote 15 minutes ago or 20 minutes ago. If you want to know the exact quote, you either have to pay extra or go to your broker. And some brokerage firms will let you do it online for yourself. You'll see the exact same, you know, the real, sometimes it's called real time as opposed to unreal time. I don't know why they call it real time, but, but um, I think I do, but it comes from the world of computers. But you are not seeing the, the, uh, the current quote you're seeing it 15 minutes ago and remember there are dozens of quotes right so so you don't really know what you're going to get but you know you're going to get something when you pick a market order well let's say you don't want to spend more than twenty dollars for a stock or thirty dollars for a stock or you won't sell it for less than twenty you can put what's called a limit order that says to the market, hey, I'm willing to buy at this price. If it, if it goes down to this price, I'll buy. If it goes up to this price, I'll sell. And you are guaranteed to get that price or better, depending on the market. Now, stops are where it gets a little tricky. A stop loss order becomes a market order once a trigger point is reached. So you say, look, I'm going to stop at 20. Okay. But... That doesn't guarantee you're going to get the price that you want, right? If you're saying, I'm not going to spend more than $20, I'll set a stop at 20 But if it goes above that, you might have to pay more because, remember, it becomes a market order. Whereas a stop limit order becomes a limit order. In other words, it won't be, a, it won't be a, a initiated until that trigger point is reached. But then it becomes a limit order. And you might say, well, what's the difference between a limit order? Well, it's subtle. This stop limit order is not seen by the, the computer systems by the and the, the traders, who the few traders that are out there still. The limit order is seen. They can see, oh, yeah, there's somebody who will buy it at 20. But the stop limit is hidden until it reaches that 
uh, that trigger, that point, that, that the price that you determined, and then it becomes a limit order. So it's very, very subtle. And although you can use limit orders to buy and sell at the price you want and stop loss and stop limit orders to lock in profits or protect against losses, remember that they trigger automatically. If for some reason you change your mind, it's too late because the, the, the happen, it happens so fast. It just happens in, in milliseconds. And so you, you forget it. You're not going to be able to, oh, I changed my mind. Too late. Too late. Slide number uh, 36 uh, describes this in a table format. And it's what we just discussed. But I never use anything other than a market order. Personally, I recommend that you do a market order. If you want to buy, buy. If you want to sell, sell. Because, again, you're not guaranteed that, that it ever will buy or ever will sell. And you'll be keep saying, I'm not going to pay more than this. Well, the price keeps going up. Well, there it goes. You, you're not going to buy. <laughs> you're not going to buy. And the same thing true on the other side. I'm not going to sell for less than this. But, oh, well. Um, Short-term traders tell me that they prefer limit orders and stop orders on all of their sales. Well, I guess that makes sense if you're trying to play and uh, gamble, speculate, speculate, sorry, that's the term we should speculate, that it makes sense for you to protect against losses on the downside and the like. So you decide and um, just make sure you understand the, the, the subtle differences between market limit, stop order, and stop limit order. Sometimes called the stop order is also called a stop loss, but it doesn't always protect you against the loss. It's just whatever you're doing, it's going to happen. As soon as that price point is triggered, it becomes a market order. That's this guy right here. Let's make sure I'm, I'm not confusing you. This guy right here. So you don't know what you're going to get once it hits that hits that trigger. Whereas the stop limit order, once it hits the trigger, it becomes a limit order, which means you know you're going to get that price if you get it. You might not get it. So have I confused you enough? My apologies. But they confuse me. And to tell you the truth, I really don't know enough about them because I don't use them and I don't like them. <laughs> you want to buy Market order. You want to sell? Market order. Don't don't drive yourself nuts. At least that's my opinion. And you're going to hear other people's opinion, obviously, because traders love them. Slide 37. Now, this slide just references a couple of concepts that we're going to come back to much later on in detail. Buying on margin and selling short. All you have to know <laughs> is what is on this slide regarding buying, buying on margin. And that's these two little signs right here, two little lines right here. It You borrow money from your broker and you can borrow up to 50% of the purchase price of a stock. So instead of having to fork over $100 for a share, you only have to fork over $50 and you borrow the rest from your broker. Sound cool? Mm, it's dangerous because now you could lose not only money that you put in, but you can lose borrowed money if it goes below 50%. But they're not going to let it happen. Not, they don't want you to, to lose that much. They want you to lose a little. I mean, I'm sorry. They want you to... Yeah. And meanwhile, you're paying interest on that money you borrowed, by the way. So your brokers love these things. And then selling short is borrowing stock. Not money, but borrowing stock and selling it now in the hopes that the price will go down. Huh? Yeah. Remember... Most people want to think about the price going up of the stock and they're happy they bought it. Well, you can do the opposite. You can be happy if the price goes down, if you sell it short. But you must buy it back eventually. Now, that's all you have to know about these two things for now. Later on, we'll get into the mechanics much later on at the end of the semester. Because my advice is to never do either. Buying on margin, maybe there's a case where you might want to buy on margin, but for the most part, don't do it. So let's read below here. The book spends much time discussing margin accounts and selling short in chapter two. Duh, why do they put it so close? <laughs> we will discuss these late in detail, late in the semester. My advice is never sell short. And folks, it's not just my advice. Peter Lynch says, don't never sell short. And who am I to argue with him? It is simply too risky. Using a margin account, buying on margin, can be useful once you've built a substantial portfolio. It allows you to borrow from your portfolio without selling your stocks and generating commissions and generating uh, capital gains. So you can think of it 
like borrowing from your house. People people use their house as collateral for a loan. Well, you can use your stocks as collateral for a loan. And that's the only reason I rec would re ever recommend uh, buying on margin. But for the most part, stay away from these two. But just make sure you understand what's on these two slides. That's all you have to know. Make a fake, make a flashcard, whatever, however you do it. You know, back, quiz yourself back and forth because it's important. You want to, you want to know at least this much for now. Later on, we'll get into more detail. Okay, what about transaction costs? Well, transaction costs have come down dramatically. They used to be in the one to five percent range, and most of that was the brokerage commission. But now deep discount brokers have driven the commissions down to $5 a trade or even free, free trades. Oh, my goodness. There's a company called Robinhood, which is very popular. We've already seen people on the, in the, uh, in the, in the um, discussion forums talking about them. And they give you free, true, well, not really. They're not really free, folks. Uh, we'll see later on why it's not really free. But have the transaction costs really gone down? And the answer is yes, they have. But more and more of the cost is being hidden from the investor. And especially the garbage internet, garbage brokers, internet brokers. I'm sorry, internet garbage brokers is what one of, one of the clients called it. it wasn't, those aren't my words. He was not a big fan of the internet brokers. And But still, you know, they're popular. What are you going to do? you gotta, you got to run with the crowd, right? No, you don't have to. But just realize... You're going to pay more if you get more um, services from a brokerage and like. But still, the transaction costs have come down dramatically. So, for example, here is an example on slide 39. A deep discount internet broker, which will remain nameless, Scott Trade, offers trades for $7. Or maybe they've lowered it. I don't know. Maybe still, you pay a, nom a very small amount. In the fine print of the client broker agreement is included a provision for allowing the broker to solely utilize exclusive stock dealers and market makers. Uh-oh, wait, 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 wait. remember the previous presentation? We talked about the dealers, the market makers, the, the specialists. We're not called specialists anymore at the New York Stock Exchange. So in other words, sure, you can buy your, your stocks through us, and we're going to charge you 5 or $7 or free, but we're going to send that to a specific market maker. And what do you think? They don't have the best price? Right. <laughs> Remember, <laughs> excuse me. <clears throat> the quoted price is simply the best price available. But at any given time, there are dozens of prices quoted as dealers and market makers compete for buy and sell orders. <clears throat> Hopefully you took a, took a look at the, uh, the um, Casas de Cambio. And you saw that the prices were all over the map, right? Everyone's, everyone's um, competing for your, your business. The chosen dealer doesn't necessarily have the best price. So instead of paying $20, which was the best price at the time, you pay $20.05. Oh, well, <laughs> you paid a nickel more. Is it really that big a deal? So the investor sees the $7 commission on their confirmation, the investor does not see the extra $5 that they paid on a 100 share purchase because of the dealer's markup. So that's an extra, what, five times, five cents times 100, an extra five bucks. But you don't see that, you understand? It doesn't show up on the, on the ticket or the email, whatever they sent you. So let's now take a look at slide number 40 because here's where it starts to get a little uh, crazy. Let's see if you can follow me on this. The following disclaimer is included in each trade confirmation email from Scott Trade. Scott Trade Incorporated receives remuneration, that means money, for directing orders to particular broker dealers or market centers for execution. Such remuneration, money, is considered compensation to the firm and the source and the amount of any compensation received by the firm in connection with your transaction will be disclosed upon request. Now, what did I just sing? <laughs> say, say. Yeah, it looks, first of all, they put it in uppercase, which is a subtle uh, subtle technique that many people use in the business world. It's supposed to make it look really important, right, because it's all in uppercase. But the truth is people don't like to read all uppercase. It's harder on our eyes. It's great for titles, you know, big titles, splashy headlines and the like. But for 
prose, it's more difficult to read. So they don't want you to really read it. And when even if you do read it, you don't know what they're saying. But what they're saying is, look, we're getting a kickback. They don't use that word. They use the word remuneration. Isn't that a great word? Uh, compensation. Now they're getting a kickback. They're sending it to a certain market maker, certain dealer, and that market maker is paying them back some money. And in Scott Trade's defense, at least they prominently disclose this relationship in every email that you get when you after you do a trade. Many others just hide it in the customer a customer agreement fine print, and the customers are never aware of this relationship. I am absolutely sure that most people who are on Robin Hood, yeah, Robin Robin Hood, right, believe that they're getting free trades. They're not. How could they believe they're getting free trades? How do you get anything for free? Well, if there's some kind of loss leader like as Fidelity does with that one mutual fund or two mutual funds. They're assuming, okay, we'll give you this one for free, but we're assuming you're going to buy others. Why does Costco sell those hot dogs for $1.50? They haven't changed the price in over 20 years. They want to get people in and buy a, a large screen television sets, right? So, so yes, it is cheaper than it used to be, but you're still paying. So don't think you're getting free trades, folks. You're getting pay, charged, but it's still a lot less than it used to be. Slide, where are we? Slide 41. The Securities Exchange Commission says your broker has a duty to seek the best execution that is reasonably available for its customers' orders. But that's not guaranteed. The Securities and Exchange Commission requires dealer brokers to notify their customers if their orders are not routed for best execution. Typically, this disclosure is on the trade confirmation you receive after placing your order. That was just the previous slide we looked at, right? And determining whether or not a customer got best execution can be very difficult. Here, in this um, this um, link at the bottom here, if you're into, into uh, law, <laughs> check it out. But here's an example of the Securities and Exchange Commission trying to enforce the rules and not doing a very good job of it. Yeah, they said, look, you guys aren't giving the best execution. They said, yeah, yeah, we are. Fire system is the best execution. So it got, you know, got to, went to the courts and wrangled, wrangled, and, and the SEC lost. So, yeah, it's up to you to trust your broker that they're not really screwing you. But you can ask. You can ask, okay, what was that remuneration? At least Scott Trade says you can do it upon request. So you're not getting free trades, but realize you're paying a whole lot less than they paid 50 years ago, 100 years ago. Slide number 42. The Securities Exchange Commission was, no more, looking into making the cost more transparent, possibly showing the customer the difference between the dealer's price and the best price available at the time of the transaction, and maybe even, gasp, showing the total cost of the transaction from the markup and markdown. The deep discount brokers were not happy about this. Needless to say, they cried that it would drive up the cost of commissions and ultimately hurt the consumer, and the proposal died. So it is up to you, dear student, to check if you're getting the best execution. But how can you, a lone investor, determine if you're getting the best price if even the Securities and Exchange Commission has trouble watching over the brokerage companies? And the answer is you can't. You just have to trust who you're with and realize that you're paying more than what you think you're paying, or you're getting less than what you think you get when you sell. See, it happens, works on both sides. Yeah, oh well. But again, it's a hell of a lot cheaper than it used to be 50, 60, 100 years ago. Now, one thing in the news, on and off, and you don't hear too much about it anymore because I think they've given up, are high-frequency trading firms. These firms use computers to transact large numbers of orders at very fast speeds. And there's a wonderful book, but again, it's already way out of date because it, it, it you know, it, new technologies have come online. But it, you get the idea from this book, how it works, called Flash Boys. A lot of fun. Anything by Michael Lewis. Read anything by Michael Lewis. He's a lot of fun. He's a great writer. He makes things that are very technically difficult, pretty easy to understand on a, on a, on a, you know, on a layman terms basis. And he also is just a lot of fun. He tells a great story. So there is little doubt that high-frequency trading has reduced transaction costs. That's There's no argument about that. These companies can do millions of transactions per second. But at the same time, these high-frequency high trading firms have been accused of using their ability to transact at the microsecond level to front-run investors. 
What does that mean? They jump. They see your your trade and they jump in front of it and they do a better trade and they turn around and, and charge you more. They're essentially stealing tiny amounts of money from the average retail investors and even large players like mutual funds. One firm, it's called IEX, is fighting back and has the backing of some very large market players. IEX has created what they call a speed bump. So the high frequency tr firms cannot jump in front of you and front run your transaction. The Securities and Exchange Commission approved them a few years ago. And big heavy hitters like Capital Group, American Funds, uh, Texas uh, Pension Fund, I think, was involved. Uh, T. Rowe Price was involved. And so these people were tired of being front run because they don't buy 100 shares. They buy 100,000 shares. So they're, they, we, they want to fight back. And so they're using IEX to do that. So now, so what was I going to say? Uh, I forget. Uh, the the high, oh, high frequency trading is no doubt reduced your transaction costs. But at the same time, it is, we can think of it like a tax. They're still, they're stealing micro pennies from us. So let, what, what, what are the numbers they throw around? Even Mr. Lewis in his book will say no one really knows because the companies won't tell you. But, but the best estimates range from about $5 billion to $15 billion a year that they're basically grabbing from investors. Now, that might sound like a lot of money to you and me, and it is, but in the grand scheme of things, with trillions of dollars trading every day, it's really not that much. And when you think about it, that's how much money, let's, let's split the difference, let's say 9 or $10 billion. That's about how much money people spend when they bet on the March Madness and NCAA basketball playoffs. <laughs> so yeah, they're stealing tiny bits of money from us, but it's really a whole lot less than people think it is, and what what and what they and what they you know used to take from us 50 years ago. So I think that's why the Securities Exchange Commission has basically raised the white flag and has given up. They don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. That's the old saying, right? How do you get rid of these guys without raising the transaction costs back up? I don't think they know how, so they're just going to say, okay, well, we, we're screwed a little bit. A little bit. Everybody's paying a few cents more. Slide number 44. Now, technology has made this basically moot. Uh, moot is a fancy word for not important anymore. It's, it's obsolete. But they still will uh, talk in terms of round lots and odd lots. Well, what is a round lot? That was, still is, 100 shares or multiples of 100 shares. Whereas an odd lot is less than 100 shares, and any mixed lots are uh, shares that have over 100, but then is not divisible by 100, like 115 or something like that. Why was this important? Well, before computers and technology basically took over the trading, it was all done by hand. It was all done by people using hand gestures and screaming out um, prices and quantities on the floor. So you would say 25 and you would pull your hands towards you. That meant you will buy, if you pull your hands towards you, you will buy 100 shares at 25. If you said two at 25 and pulled your hands forward, that meant you would buy 200 shares at 25, right? And if you want to sell them, you move your hand away from you. You push you're pushing it to somebody else. So that made it faster, right? They could just say one word, 25, or one phrase, you know, one number. And everybody else would understand he's trying to buy or sell 25, 100 shares at $25 a share. If you had to sell an odd lot, you had to say 17 shares at 25. And then push or pull whether you wanted to buy or sell. So you see it, it slowed trading down. So they used to hit you with an odd lot differential. It's the extra cost of trading because it slows the trading down. And it was typically 12 and a half cents to 15 cents. Yeah, believe it or not, it was 12 and a half cents to 15 cents. But now it's all done by computers, and the computers don't care. They're fast whether it's 100 shares or not. So it's typically less than 5 cents a share. Sometimes a penny a share. I mean, depending on what what, uh, what stock you're dealing with, if it's a very large company with millions of shares. Yeah, it might they might share with a penny, 
And some people say, oh, you should always just buy uh, 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 round lots. We recommend against buying odd lots. Eee, on 10 shares, it might be an extra buck, right? Or 80 shares, it might be an extra $2. It's not a big deal. But you have to know it. We want you to know it because you're the investment guru for your friends and family, right? I think I've told you that already. Yeah, I think I have. And uh, <laughs> and so when they say, what's this odd lot? I don't understand. He said he didn't don't, don't sell big. Don't buy 17 shares because that's an odd lot. And you can tell him, don't worry about it. You're getting charged an extra 17 cents. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Slide number 45. Come on. Why isn't it? Okay. There we go. Slide number 45. Reading stock quotes. Well, um, different sources will contain some or all or more of these statistics. Always remember that the quoted prices are not the only prices available. And at any given time, there are many prices available from many different dealers, market makers, the quoted prices are the best prices that are available. Plus, you're seeing the current prices 15 to 20 minutes ago. So all these things, we'll go into detail more about them. We're going to ask you what the dividend yield, what the P-E ratio, the volume and that change. Um, some of them are self-explanatory. The one that's probably the is uh, scaring you the most is the P-E, because we've already made mention of it, and we'll talk about it in detail later on, so, so don't freak out. The dividend yield is very cool, and it's one of the things you're going to look up. That tells us how much it's paying us as a percentage uh, in dividends, realizing that dividends are not guaranteed, but we'll, we'll go into those in detail. So, so you go to Yahoo, you go to MarketWatch or Bloomberg, you're going to get some all or some more probably, obviously, we're going to get more than this. But this is what you used to get in the, in the newspaper, right? Slide number 46. Speaking of the newspaper, here's the, the Wall Street Journal, which is now owned by Fox News, <laughs> believe that or not. And uh, they're one of the few last, that last newspapers that actually include the stock quotes. All the, all the other papers gave up. They used to have them, but not anymore. Oh, my God. You mean, you, actually, you mean you actually wait until the next day to find out how much your stock is worth? How 20th century. <laughs> And people ask me if I read the Wall Street Journal. I said, used to, but not anymore. It's become a propaganda tool for Fox News, which is basically the propaganda arm arm of the Republican Party. So I don't trust them anymore. They, they, they used to be able to trust the Wall Street Journal to be pretty much unbiased. They certainly were biased toward business, so they would they would trump it, which is you know what they're supposed to do. They're the Wall Street Journal, but. They you know, they did their best not to be uh, partisan, and as we'll see, it turns out the stock market does better under Democratic administrations than under other Republican administrations. But again, the, the president really doesn't have that much to do with it, to be truthful. They can screw things up royally, and they can act as a big cheerleader, but it's more importantly, it's what you and I do. Get up, go to work, <laughs> produce the goods and services, consume the goods and services. That's what's important. So I don't even bother with the Wall Street Journal. Uh, so let's take a look at who we can trust and who are good places for us to go find uh, stock quotes. And here they are on slide 47. Bloomberg. Now the gentleman <laughs> running for office is the guy who started this Bloomberg. And it's actually very good. Most of the people I deal with in the industry you know, who are more buy and sell, buy and sell stock people, they love Bloomberg. Bloomberg Terminal. I forget, I don't forget. It's not that expensive, but you have to pay for it. And but they give you a lot of good stuff for free. Market Watch is the free version of the Wall Street Journal, and it is very different than the Wall Street Journal. I don't know why they allow them to be editorially uh, independent. But I was surprised. I thought, oh well, Market Watch is going to become like Fox News. And no, they haven't. They haven't. They have. They have a fairly uh, wide range of topics and uh, and opinions on the on the website, and it's free. Morningstar is another one that's free. They started out with mutual funds, but now they do stocks. But be careful because every five seconds you're going to get a pop-up window asking you to, to join their premium service. And I'm like, yeah, you know, they got to make money too, right? And then Google. Google, I don't know why Google. Google usually, whenever they do something, they do a very good job. But when they became public, they said they would never have a very good financial website. And they weren't lying. You know? <laughs> it works, but it, it's not that powerful. And I don't understand why. I don't understand why. And if you have any others, please tell me because I'm looking for a good replacement for Yahoo because I still use Yahoo. It's still got a lot of good stuff on it, but it used to be the best free website bar none. 
And now they've destroyed it. Well, they've destroyed Yahoo too. Uh, I, you know, if you have Yahoo Mail, still, still, I, I feel sorry for you, but uh, but it's still got some good stuff on it. Here, dear online students, is where we would stop, and then I would, on using the computer in the classroom, show people the different websites. There's an accompanying presentation that will show you how to use the uh, the, the websites. So uh, you don't really need me to tell you. You just go in there and start banging away, and you'll find the stuff that we're asking you to find in the Chapter 5 assignment. And if you can't, you know, send me an email, contact me, and we'll, we'll take a look at it, okay? Okay. So, whew, that was our third presentation. I go back and study this again because we want you to know the difference between a, a market order, a limit order, a stop loss, and a stop limit. And we also want you to know about transaction costs, yeah, so at least that you can talk um, fluently with one of your friends and family and co-workers. But in our next presentation, we finally, finally, after dancing around these things all semester long, get to, in detail, discuss the various market indices and averages. Okay? So we'll see you in our next presentation. Study hard. Bring honor and glory to Southwestern College, your friends, your family, your co-workers, and be awesome, dear students.